So Michelle, Michelle Hai, our managing editor, thank you very much for putting this together and convening today. Welcome to everybody. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. It's my pleasure, it's my honor to introduce Francis Fukuyama, Frank Fukuyama of Stanford, of American Purpose, of a good list of significant books, countless essays and opinion pieces and podcasts, good heavens. But, but now uh, the author of a new important book titled Liberalism and Its Discontents, American Purpose was founded 18 months ago. It's a baby still, but, but moving actively, energetically, 18 months old, and we launched. The lead essay in the launch was Frank's essay of the same title. Now there's the book. Uh, Frank has, if you haven't read it, I, I'm sorry I can't hold it up. I have it from Kindle and it's been read by me on my iPad. Thank you, Frank, for doing the honors. There it is, liberals, liberalism and its discontents. Um, it, it's a it's a what? Thank you, uh, Tom Ilvis, <laughs> President <laughs> Ilvis. Um, it, it's a wonderful book because it's got depth. Uh, it's uh, clear as glass to read, both its prose, but also the organization, starting with what is classical liberalism and how is it taken in a second chapter, I believe it is, uh, two extremes and what is neoliberalism and so forth. I think the timing is so important and the message and the messenger of Francis Fukuyama are vitally important. Welcome to all of you. We're gonna hear a book talk by Frank. Then we're gonna have Q and A from you all in the gallery. And we're gonna have a hard stop no later than 1255 Eastern. So we're gonna break no later than five minutes before the hour. Welcome Frank. Great to see you. Congratulations on the book. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jeff. And thanks to all of you uh, in the uh, American Purpose family. Uh, I'm sorry I haven't been able to attend as many of these talks as uh, I'd like to, but um, you know, I've, been, <laughs> I've traveled every single week for the last uh, seven weeks and it's not over yet. Um, so as Jeff said, uh, this book is really the product of American Purpose. I wrote that original essay and my UK publisher, Andrew Franklin, liked it and said it's a really important issue, you should turn it into a book. Uh, and so I uh, went about doing that and in the process I was able to, uh, you know, think through a number of the assertions that I had made back then and fortify them. Uh, in some cases, modify them. And so the book uh, that you're, uh, that's just been published this past week is, is the product of this. So uh, let me just begin. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism of liberalism. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, begin at a different point. So I need to define what I mean by liberalism or classical liberalism. Uh, it's not Americans, the American understanding of liberalism. It's not left of center progressive politics, which I think in the hands of a lot of progressives has become illiberal uh, in recent years. Uh, it's also not liberalism in the European sense of the German free Democrats, which is a kind of market friendly, but socially fairly uh, progressive uh, uh, position. Uh, that's not my definition, it's certainly not you know, a lot of people on the right think of classical liberalism as basically libertarianism. And it's also not the definition that I'm using. That's a kind of anti-government, anti-state uh, uh, posture that uh, I really don't agree with. Um, I would define it in the following way. Uh, a liberal regime uh, is based on a belief in the moral equivalency of all human beings. Uh, and that individuals are uh, due a sphere of autonomy. Uh, and in that respect, their dignity uh, has to be respected by the state. It is institutionalized through a rule of law, uh, through constitutional checks and balances against excessive state uh, authority that uh, allows individuals to exercise that autonomy 
uh, as they see fit. You know, what they do in life, what they say, uh, uh, if they want to criticize the government, that is perfectly acceptable. They can associate, they can believe uh, if they live in a cultural or religious uh, uh, tradition, and ultimately they should have some uh, part in ruling. And so it becomes related to democracy uh, in that sense. It's not connected in my mind to a particular economic posture. So it is not, um, uh, uh, it's not a small state necessarily in, in economic terms. I think that Sweden and Denmark two social democracies are liberal states, even though they have tax rates, marginal tax rates over 50%, and they're liberal because they protect those individual uh, rights and respect the dignity uh, of all of their citizens in a, in a very open way. Uh, you can have a small state and you can, all, you, know, you can still be liberal and so forth. Uh, so that's the way in which I'm using the term liberalism. Uh, as in the essay, I start out with three arguments for liberalism that I think we tend to forget. The first is really an argument from pragmatism. Liberalism arose in the middle of the 17th century after uh, Europeans had fought 150 years of religious wars following on the Protestant Revolution, uh, Re Reformation. And, you know, th there were wars that led to uh, maybe the loss of a third of the population of Central Europe. Uh, and at that point, a number of liberal thinkers got up and said, well, maybe this isn't such a good idea to be slaughtering ourselves over a particular vision of the good life. Maybe we should just protect life itself uh, and make tolerance of different um, uh, views of the good life, uh, the central virtue in uh, a new order. So in, in other words, there's a deliberate lowering of horizons uh, to uh, allow for disagreement and diversity uh, of the sort that had propelled these religious wars earlier. Uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, religion was displaced by a kind of aggressive nationalism or sense of national identity as uh, the main form of diversity. And once again, after two world wars, in 1945, uh, a lot of Europeans come to the realization that, yeah, maybe it's better to have a liberal order in which uh, our pursuit of a expansive national identity uh, is displaced by uh, a system of law. And that was really the birth of the European Union and, you know, the kind of peace that has flowed from that uh, liberal uh, international order. So that's the pragmatic justification. Moral justification has to do with liberalism's protection of autonomy. So you say, in what sense could we possibly think that all human beings are equal? They're not equal in skin color, in height, in intelligence, in physical strength. Uh, you know, many characteristics make them different from one another. I think the liberal answer to this is actually buried in a Judeo-Christian tradition that begins with the book of Genesis, where Adam and Eve uh, disobey God's order and eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And in doing that, they, they sin, but uh, they show that they actually have a choice. They could have chosen uh, to follow God's will, but they chose wrongly. And it is that ability to choose to make moral judgments that is really the core of human dignity and human essence. Uh, and that is the sense in which people are equal, right? So Martin Luther King in 1964 says, I look forward to the day when my children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their characters. And that points exactly to that, you know, moral autonomy uh, that is at the, at the heart of the kind of liberal assertion of, of universal equality. So liberalism protects uh, that. And then finally, because liberalism also protects property rights and the right to transact and, uh, you know, is built around a rule of law, it's also been incredibly successful uh, economically. When China started to modernize in 1978, they actually adopted certain, you know, liberal uh, principles. Uh, uh, they developed quasi-property rights so that peasants could keep the 
surplus that they produced on their um, plots, uh, as opposed to the collective farms that they had been working in. Uh, people were allowed a greater degree of individual freedom to transact. You had entrepreneurs and then the development of a market economy. And I think that liberal principles historically have been strongly associated with economic growth, modernization, uh, and the like. All right. So those are the reasons why you should want to live in a uh, liberal society. Uh, I believe that a lot of the current discontents really have to do with taking a, 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 a liberal principle and then stretching it to an extreme where it became counterproductive. And there was one effort on the right and then another effort on the left. You could call the the right-wing version neoliberalism, and you could call the left-wing version woke liberalism, right? So neoliberalism on the right is something associated with, you know, people like Milton Friedman, the Chicago School, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher beginning in the late 70s and 80s began to espouse a kind of belief in markets as the solution to many social problems. Uh, and to see the state as the enemy uh, of, of those solutions, that the state got in the way of entrepreneurship, it led to lower economic growth, and they were right, you know, in many respects, there was overregulation uh, at that time, but the principle of free markets got carried to unsupportable extremes in which, for example, regulation of the financial sector was progressively dismantled, uh, beginning in the late 80s and continuing through the you know 1990s that led directly to the kind of financial instability that uh, characterized the world economy as a whole but hit the United States you know the originator of this deregulatory move particularly hard in 2008 with the financial crisis uh, as a result of this worship of markets you had the growth of a tremendous amount of uh, economic and social inequality uh, especially in the countries that pioneered this revolution, uh, Britain and the United States. And so I don't think it's an accident that you got a, uh, a backlash movement, a populist backlash movement in both of those countries because, you know, there had been an effort to dismantle social protections and uh, let market forces do their, their, their will that led to, uh, you know, ordinary people really being uh, screwed and the elites uh, managing to preserve their um, their fortunes and their social position. The woke liberalism, I would say, proceeds from another aspect of autonomy, which has to do with individual autonomy. Um, traditionally, that's been conceived of as the ability to follow uh, a moral order uh, within a religious tradition or within a cultural tradition. But increasingly, a lot of liberal theorists like John Rawls began to say, well, no, it's just the autonomy itself. In a way, it doesn't matter the substantive choices that people are making. What needs to be protected is the right to make choices. And indeed, uh, not just choices within a moral framework, you should be able to make the moral framework yourself. Um, Justice Kennedy had a line in, in, um, you know, in that famous court uh, uh, decision, um, um, in the Casey decision where he said that's the essence of human you know, choice is to be able to basically design your own moral order. And obviously you can't have a society if everybody is making up the rules about the, that society. So it leads to, you know, in one instance, a kind of expressive individualism that, you know, eats as an acid uh, 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 all existing moral uh, claims. But it also leads to a version of identity politics because it turns out that what people will choose if they're allowed to is, you know, to um, associate themselves in groups and to make demands in terms of their group identities. Uh, there's a liberal version of identity politics and an illiberal version of it. Uh, the liberal version is one where, you know, African Americans, women gays and lesbians, you know, associate uh, in a movement to demand uh, an equality of rights, that they want to be treated just the way that people in the mainstream are treated. I find it hard to object to that 
form of identity politics because the goal ultimately is a liberal one, you know, that they want to be treated equally uh, and seen as individuals. But there is an illiberal form of identity politics, which demands not the recognition of me as an equal individual, but of my group. Uh, and the pluralism is a pluralism based on groups in which your membership in you know, what's called an ascriptive group, meaning a group that you don't have any choice over, you know, like your race, identity, gender, uh, and so forth, is really the most essential uh, characteristic. And in that tradition, you have, um, you know, a, 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 a rejection of the liberal principle of individualism, that it's our, these group memberships that are really the most important things that anyone can know about us and therefore should be the basis of resource allocation, jobs, you know, uh, uh, and the like. Uh, and that, uh, I think, leads us to uh, a left-wing attack on liberalism that you see in a lot of, you know, uh, precincts and cultural precincts like universities, you know, the arts, Hollywood, uh, and so forth, where these um, demands for group recognition begin to trump, uh, you know, our liberal understanding of, uh, of equality. Uh, the final thing I'll say that is probably the most troubling is uh, in, in chapter six of my book, I trace uh, the cognitive uh, arc that we've been following over the last few centuries, but particularly in the last couple of generations. Liberalism was always associated with a cognitive mode known as modern natural science. Uh, this understanding of human cognition believes that there is an objective world beyond our subjective perceptions of it, and that that world can be apprehended through the scientific method, through experimentalism, and then manipulated. And it's this cognitive mode that then produces modern science, which in turn produces modern technology, which in turn makes possible all of the growth of productivity that characterizes uh, a modern uh, economy. Uh, and so it's very central to the liberal project, uh, this understanding of how we human beings perceive the world. But this has come under threat uh, uh, initially from the left. And so there's a line of thinkers, and I know these guys very well because I studied with a number of them when I was young and foolish, uh, you know, that, that begin with, um, you know, a belief that words don't actually reflect reality, they shape reality, they're kind of imposed on reality by the speakers. This, um, you know, structuralism leads to post-structuralism, to post-modernism, whose single biggest um, theorist was Michel Foucault, who made an argument uh, essentially about biopower, what he called biopower, that said that uh, actually, uh, you know, well, in the old days, an, uh, uh, an elite, a leader would simply order the death of a subject. You know, he'd use overt power uh, to control his subjects. But today they behave differently. They use the language of science to manipulate people into thinking that scientific assertions actually reflect uh, some kind of higher reality, but in fact they are actually created by elites in order to manipulate you, ordinary people. He applied this to madness, incarceration, homosexuality, uh, a whole number of areas, but by the end of his career he kind of applied it to everything, uh, you know, that biopower permeates a uh, uh, you know, our entire uh, consciousness created by modern science. Uh, and, you know, this was then translated into uh, a lot of critical theory. I think the uh, extreme sensitivity towards words really comes out of this tradition where language is seen uh, not as an effort to explain or interpret reality, it's, it's seen as an uh, exercise of power. Uh, which is why people are so sensitive to, you know, pronouns and, and you know, and this sort of thing. And now what's happened is that this conspiracist thinking about science has migrated over to the, uh, to the right. So you look in the COVID epidemic, um, uh, they say the same things Foucault is saying, you know, that these public health authorities are not objective scientists. They are actually uh, 
representatives of hidden elites that want to use science in order to gain power, uh, gain power over you. And that's why they're pushing mask mandates or vaccine mandates or other uh, things that they claim are rooted in, in, in objective science, but they're uh, really not. I actually, I wrote this in my blog about a year ago, uh, this transition from the left to the right. And I said in the, in the blog post that I didn't think that anyone in the Trump administration actually read Foucault. And uh, one of our American Purpose contributors, a professor wrote back and said, no, that's not true. And she named three people, three speech writers in the Trump White House that actually had referred to Foucault. And then people like Peter Thiel, who you know, read very widely and actually had absorbed some of those, um, uh, some of those um, uh, concepts. So in any event, that's where we are when you combine this kind of subjective understanding uh, of cognition with social media, you end up with a big disaster because social media basically takes out all of the in intermediaries that had vetted and uh, you know verified of you know just simple empirical facts. Uh, and without that support, you know, at this point, anyone can say anything they want to on the internet, and they uh, do, and it's very toxic to democratic. Uh, uh, deliberation. So that's, I think, where we are. The two extremes, both the neoliberalism and the woke liberalism, feed off of each other. Uh, uh, I just gave a talk uh, yesterday in San Francisco where <laughs> I, I, I didn't expect to find this in California. I, I, there's probably like 12 conservatives in the whole state of California. They're all at my talk and they're all at the dinner afterwards. And uh, all of them saying very loudly that, you know, don't blame Trump, blame uh, woke liberalism. That's really what's driving people. But there's obviously an interplay, you know, between these two extreme versions and they contribute to the polarization that um, we face. The final thing uh, that I'll say, which my audience, which these particular people last night took serious objection to was the question, which is the bigger threat right now? Which of these two illiberal threats is bigger? And in my view, there's just no question that the, the one coming from the right is a bigger threat because it's connected to a big international movement, populist movement whose you know, uh, central axis is really Vladimir Putin who has relations with Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour and Donald Trump and Viktor Orban and a whole list of uh, populist nationalists um, all over the world. Uh, and the threat I think in the United States is particularly severe. You know, what we've learned now from the work of the January 6th uh, committee is that January 6th was not a spontaneous protest that somehow got out of hand. It was very deliberately planned by the president and you know, people like John Eastman who had a theory about how you could overturn uh, an election. Uh, they didn't manage to execute it because they couldn't persuade uh, Vice President Pence to go along. But you know, as we speak, they're changing uh, uh, the way that votes will be counted in the next election. And you know, we'll try to do the same thing uh, again. And so it's a very explicit threat well, and I guess the final thing to say is just that, you know, in a normal and healthy democracy, people that tried to do something like this would immediately be uh, marginalized and pushed off as extremists. And, you know, the thing that's been the, very disappointing is that this hasn't happened. And if anything, there's been a big effort to normalize them. The threat from the left, the liberal threat from the left, I think, is a longer term one that is primarily cultural. You know, the big instances, let's say, of cancellation are not things that are being done by the government. They're really being done by various institutions and universities and, you know, the media uh, and so forth. Um, and, you know, it also is, I mean, something we could talk about uh, how big this threat is, because a lot of my people on the progressive left say it's not that big a deal. Uh, it's just limited to a small set of elite institutions and it's not 
generally taking root in, in the whole society. I think that's a debatable uh, point because I do think that politics and ultimately policy are downstream of ideas and culture. And once these ideas get out, uh, you know, they are going to have uh, an effect on politics and policy. Um, so maybe I'll end there and, you know, see, see what questions or reactions people have. So Frank, thank you. Uh, while you gather your thoughts and raise your hand with the raised hand function or put your, your question in chat, I'm gonna ask one follow on to that, Frank. For our friend, Steve Trachtenberg, the former president of George Washington University uh, says to me that in the university and higher education sphere, he thinks there are problems in the same way you do. He also says, you know, some of it is foolishness that will just fade if you let it be and don't pump it up. How do you think about that and how do you sort that and how do you think about balance between what's be taken seriously, a problem, a threat, and what's perhaps a fad that just goes away on its own in the next couple or so years? Well, um, first of all, I don't think it's gonna go away on its own. Uh, I think it's not gonna go away unless people push back uh, against it. Uh, you know, it really came up uh, big time for the first time in the 1980s and my mentor Alan Bloom then wrote the closing of the American mind and you know pointed out um, some of the absurdities of you know that version of identity politics and then things kind of calmed down in the 1990s and into the 2000s and it wasn't that big an issue but it's now been revived but I do think that it is possible to mobilize and criticize it and I think if people don't criticize it uh, it's not going to go away and I think you're seeing you know uh, some signs of this happening. I was very pleased when The Economist actually did a whole cover criticizing uh, trans activism and the idea of transphobia as being, you know, uh, the driving force in American, you know, society. Uh, uh, and so I think that, you know, that, um, that can be pushed back. Uh, but I honestly don't really have a good sense of well, I, I, one further thing to say is I, I really do think the nature of our media environment makes it very easy to take, you know, anecdotal instances of this kind of ridiculous illiberalism and then blow it up, you know, so that uh, on the right, everybody then talks about it. You know, I have a conservative friend that I'm constantly arguing with and he says, well, it's obvious there's no such thing as academic freedom on, on university campuses. And I keep telling him, you know, I'm on a university campus. I can say anything I damn please, you know, critical of the government, critical of uh, uh, whatever, except on a certain range of kind of civil rights related issues having to do with gender, race, ethnicity, and so forth. And there, indeed, you do have to be uh, careful, but to compare this to a kind of real tyranny that, that eliminates freedom of speech, like what's going on in Russia right now, they're just not, they're really not commensurable. So I guess that's, that's as much as I can, you know, figure uh, on this question. So, so thank you. So we have 25 minutes, you all. Michelle, I'm gonna mention related parenthetically that you might wish to post in chat, the piece we ran recently by Jonathan Rauch on transgender issues, politics, and ideology. I thought it was a, a smart piece, an interesting piece. Let's go to Daniel and Frank and Keith. In each case, not everybody knows everybody. So if I may invite you to introduce yourself, Daniel, great to see you. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Frank, uh, for uh, uh, Jeff's comment that your book is clear as glass. Uh, is an amazing, uh, is true and uh, all the more amazing given the, the nuances of the topics you're grappling with. I, uh, I formerly was at the Hewlett Foundation where I directed the, the Foundation's US Democracy Grant Making. I'm now a, a, a senior fellow and advisor um, with the Defending Democracy Together Institute, which looks to kind of bring about longer term solutions to democracy from a center right perspective. Um, uh, Frank, a, a question for you, uh, and I, I guess I would put this as, as maybe a, a challenge to one aspect of your framing around 
is the threat greater from the right or the left? And uh, I wonder what we would make of the following proposition that those two threats are in effect interrelated and symbiotic, that they each feed off of, of the other. So that for example, uh, the, uh, we know that in the United States, the Republican party and uh, former President Trump have become increasingly xenophobic with respect to uh, matters related to immigration. We've kind of continued to see the disastrous consequences of that. Um, uh, but almost, you know, it, 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 at the same time, you have the basically all the candidates in the last uh, uh, primary election for the Democratic uh, presidential nomination. If I'm not mistaken, all they, I don't know where the President Biden was on this, but there was effectively a shared consensus that there should decriminalize illegal immigration and to kind of, in effect, open up the border. Yeah. In ways that had no grounding in, in what the vast majority of Americans. I think you have these two increasingly extreme positions. I think you see the same thing around abortion, um, where the the more that one uh, side slides off the deep end, it, it kind of stokes and amplifies a, a, a countervailing and equally extreme point of view. On the other side, I, I would also note that you know, with respect to the the, the creeping in of the kind of post-structuralist. Uh, thinking about the science on the right, I, I think it was a quite valid critique of a lot of the public health statements early on uh, that they were about imposing not just a, a scientific point of view, but a set of values um, uh, in the name of science. And so when the, the you know, thousand leading public health authorities came out and said that while um, uh, you know, protesting the closing of businesses was not warranted, uh, protesting in the names of Black Lives Matter was warranted from a public health perspective, I think a lot of people said, "Oh, so you're just saying, if we're if we're doing something that agrees with what the official does uh, want, that's legitimate." So anyway, I, I just really see these two things as is feeding off of each other, and so does that render the question of which side is more to blame, you know, uh, less interesting than the tracing the connections between them? No, oh, Daniel, I uh, agree with that completely, and you know, one of the disappointing things about you know, the current administration and the Democratic Party in general is that they haven't recognized the degree to which uh, their own actions uh, have fostered this kind of extreme reaction on the right. You didn't mention defund the police, which has, you know, has to be one of the stupidest slogans ever uh, uttered by a, you know, a, 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 a political uh, movement. Uh, which I think has also contributed to, you know, to this. Uh, so I think that's right. Um, I just, you know, the only reason I think that the threat from the left, the right is more um, uh, vivid right now is that I don't see on the left, there's an actual attempt to seize power in effect, uh, you know, extra constitutionally. That might come at some future point. Uh, and in fact, just to amplify what you were saying, if Donald Trump is declared the winner in 2024, uh, and there are some irregularities in, you know, the way that votes are counted, or even if there aren't irregularities, I expect that there's going to be a lot of very similar moves by people on the left uh, to, you know, contest the legitimacy of that election. And that's one of the reasons why I think we really got to amend that Electoral Count Act because it opens the door to both parties to basically make the election not about what the American people choose, but you know, a sheer power play between them about who can mobilize more people on the streets and you know something that may descend into violence. So you know I'm agreeing with you that uh, you know there is that that interaction. Frank um Daniel, thank you. Frank, thank you. And Frank, we're going to go to you next. You have the floor. Hi. Uh, so I'm Frank DiStefano. Uh, my focus has been on the breakdown in our political parties and and uh, what we need to do to, to, to fix it. So naturally, you know, I, I agree entirely with the analysis. And so what's worrying me, and I want to get your reaction on this, is that it's not just that there are these bad ideas in circulation, because there's always bad ideas in circulation in society. 
it's that this fight between these two versions of illiberalism are replacing the political framework and the ideological framework by which we think about everything, which what used to be liberalism and conservatism as they get replaced by two illiberal ideologies. Um, that doesn't just affect elections and the political parties. It affects the way we as a society look at everything. And then if you have two illiberal ideologies crowding out and fighting and framing the way we look at everything, then the result of what happens will inevitably be some form of an illiberal outcome. And that's the thing that worries me the most about what's going on. So it seems to me that the only solution to that is those who are concerned about it, who I think are a majority of the country, would have to build a countervailing movement built on liberal principles again, and not just say what we had was great because that's 20th century liberalism, but to build a new energy and movement to replace a place in this framework with 21st century liberalism. And that's what I see. There are efforts now going on to, to do this in, here and there. But there's no great movement. People are complaining about this, but there hasn't been the energy behind building an ideological intellectual movement like something like the progressive movement or, or, or you know, a, a big national movement to do that. And if that doesn't happen, then the framework will be two illiberal ideologies and they will crowd everything else out. So that's what I'm worried about. What do you think about that? No, I think you're right. Uh... You know, that's kind of the reason that I wrote uh, the book, because the term liberalism had been appropriated, uh, you know, by both the left and the right, you know, in, in versions that I don't agree with. And for people in the center left and center right that actually do want to defend liberalism as I've defined it, they don't have a word to describe what they are, right? Um, uh, and I think that the way that you rebuild that center is by being clear about what ideas you are defending. You, you know, you need a term to describe it. So, I, uh, I don't mind describing myself as a classical liberal because, you know, that. But maybe that's the wrong word. You know, maybe you actually, because of all these wrong associations with the word liberalism, you need to come up with a completely different term to define. You know what's essentially the same set of ideas, but you know without the negative connotations. Maybe that's something that you know some political genius can figure out uh, how to do. But I do think that you're not going to build that movement unless you have a clear framing of the ideas, and then that gets translated into a movement and you know a set of cultural uh, inclinations. Uh, and you know I, I still think that defending. Uh, you know, those are important. For example, two basic liberal or several basic liberal principles. One of them is uh, freedom of speech. In many universities, to say that you're defending freedom of speech uh, tags you as a conservative. And a lot of people will stop listening to you if you say, you know, you're defending it or you're defending due process, another, you know, basic liberal term. And I just, and, and, you know, the one I spend the most time on in, in my book is patriotism. Um, the idea that you should actually be proud of your country and cultivate pride in your country if it's a liberal uh, country is something that, you know, a lot of liberals abandon trying to do. And so in all of those cases, I think that that's territory. It's not new territory, but it is it's principal territory that we need to reclaim uh, if you are going to you know, have an alternative to the two illiberal uh, uh, ideologies that are out there. So that's why I wrote the book. You know, we'll see whether you can get more people to stand up and say, yeah, I'm a kind of liberal in that in that original sense. So thanks, gentlemen. We have 14 minutes to go. Sorry about that. That's my fault or responsibility. Let's go to Keith, John, John Holt, and Christina and see where we are. Be brief, but you do have the floor. Keith, you've waited patiently. Well, I hope you can hear me. I'm calling in a rather bad line from London. Uh, I'm a former member of the Westminster Parliament. It's a little bit faint. Uh, Keith, just speak out loud and clear. Okay, can you hear me now? Pretty much. Okay, I'll try. Um, my question is brief. 
Uh, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, but shortly before she died, commented in an interview on the current bout of populism and on the Trump era. And she said this, <clears throat> she thought the symbol of the United States should not be the bald eagle, but the pendulum. In other words, there would be a history code that about to extremism were followed swing back. Uh, do you agree with that? And if so, how do you think that will come about? Uh, well, there is a pendulum, political pendulum swinging uh, in several respects. I mean, certainly in economic policy, you know, neoliberalism has now been supplanted by much more government activism and supporting, you know, the economy and equality and so forth. And we've gone through several of those swings. I think that liberalism itself has gone through uh, several swings. Uh, and that's true if you look over the centuries, because, you know, it's created in the 17th century to deal with religion, then it gets revived in the 19th, 20th centuries to deal with nationalism. Uh, it's been taken for granted by many people in the last 70 years since 1945. Uh, and so it's, you know, fading once again. Uh, and I think that, you know, maybe the Russian invasion of Ukraine and other developments will remind people why it's a valuable thing and maybe the pendulum will start to swing back. That's a hope rather than a, you know, than a prediction. Uh, but I do think that we don't ever reach a kind of steady state where you know, there's a dominant set of ideas that just go on forever. I, I think they're not sustainable in that sense. And so, you know, I do think we need to look to where the pendulum is going to move next. So thanks, Keith, for the question and joining today. We're going to go to you, John, probably the penultimate, and then Christina, but we'll see where we are. John Holt, you have the floor. Yes. Uh, the late Peter Berger, a uh, sociologist of religion, uh, would talk about functional equivalence of religion in a secular state. And it seems to me that uh, much of the activity, the political activity these days, uh, uh, speaks to that. Uh, that is the politics of meaning, that people seem to have a desperate uh, and inherent uh, need for meaning. Uh, can you comment on that, Mr. Fukuyama? Yeah, uh, actually, Tara Isabella Burton, who has written for American Purpose, and I guess she, you did an event with her, didn't you, Jeff? We did about three weeks ago. Yeah, so she has a, a kind of updated version uh, of Berger's uh, thesis, uh, where she points to a lot of activities as kind of, you know, reimagined religion that's basically coming off of the same impulses you say that people have for, um, uh, you know, for meaning in life. Uh, and she points to a lot of activities, you know, even something like Soul Cycle or the wellness movement that uh, have been given a spiritual dimension. Uh, they're not simply about physical health, but they're also about spiritual health or people turning, you know, to yoga uh, or to other you know, forms of, of religiosity that um, are not typically, you know, seen as, as uh, expressions of religion. And she includes in this, you know, wokeness uh, that social justice has replaced uh, religious belief as a means of commitment. Uh, it's a way of revealing your inner faith in, you know, in a certain set of uh, basic values. And so, I think that that's probably correct. I think that, you know, the religious impulse is kind of hardwired into human beings and it's going to take a variety of forms. People have been walking away from, uh, you know, the traditional ex, uh, expressions of, of religion uh, in great numbers in the last couple of decades, but it doesn't mean that the underlying human impulse has gone away. And I must say that, if you try to explain the current polarization in the United States in a kind of, well, you know, let's say rational actor terms like the economists like to use, or in terms of traditional policy preferences, which political scientists used to focus on, I just don't think you can do it. 
you really can't explain people's loyalties, uh, 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 you know, because they will frequently vote for things or they'll support politicians that actually are bad for their economic self-interest. You know, like Southern white voters uh, were among the biggest beneficiaries of Obamacare, and yet, you know, they they voted for politicians that wanted to uh, dismantle it. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of, let's say, the anti-vax movement or, you know, other things, certainly a lot of the social justice advocacy is more about, uh, you know, kind of expressing your, the positioning of your inner self with respect to these moral um, uh, signposts. Uh, so, yeah, so basically this is a long-winded way of saying that I kind of agree with your understanding of, you know, Berger's um, uh, view of religion. So thank you, gentlemen. Christina, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm, um, my name is Christina Lugo. I'm, I'm transgender, and I've been an activist in the trans community most of my adult life. I'm a host of a radio show, and I've also been really deeply involved in leftist politics most of my adult life. But I've always considered myself a liberal, and I'm just not sure why you think that, uh, like, the movement for transgender rights, the movement for queer rights, um, Black Lives Matter is somehow outside of liberalism, because I've always seen it as part of the liberal project. It's about the expansion of rights for minorities. It's about freedom of sp speech. It's about equal treatment under the law. I mean, I know that there's a lot of people on the left who don't consider themselves liberals, but I would say the movement of identity politics as fundamentally a liberal project. Could you comment? Yeah, well, you know, I, I uh, talked about this earlier. I think there's two versions of identity politics, one of which is liberal and the other of which is illiberal. And so if the demand is that transgender people, uh, just like, you know, African Americans or women or anybody else be accepted and treated with respect and dignity the way other people are, that is indeed a liberal demand. And it's one, as I said, I don't see how any liberal can fail to support. Uh, and I certainly support that. Uh, the illiberal part comes in, you know, the treatment of people. So, well, Jonathan Rauch, you know, actually talked about a number of cases of this in his uh, in his um, article. But for example, a lot of the trans activists, uh, you know, assert that there is no connection. Uh, between uh, gender and biological sex. Uh, now, <laughs> I just think that this is kind of an absurd proposition, but, you know, if you were to articulate that position that there is, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not inevitably linked together, but, you know, for good evolutionary reasons, there is a connection between biological sex and gender that applies to many people. If you tried to say that in many university settings, you would be denounced as a transphobe because it's not enough to accept individual trans people as equal individuals. You also have to buy into a larger ideology that makes you assert things that, you know, to me are just manifestly untrue. Uh, and, you know, you are uh, attacked and, and shunned if you express those opinions. And that is illiberal. Uh, so that's really where I would, you know, where I would make uh, uh, the distinction. But certainly you're right. I mean, you know, that movement, like all of the other civil rights uh, movements that we've experienced, uh, you know, does definitely have a liberal form and it's one that liberals ought to support. So thank you, Christina. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we have four minutes to go and I'm going to uh, pose a final question to Tom Ilvis and Frank. Tom Ilvis is the former president of Estonia and he's about to speak to a university audience in the national capital of Ukraine. And Frank, we're gonna give you the last word. The, the question is, why is it that for many of us, the war in Ukraine is about Ukraine, first and foremost, and the region, certainly, but it represents a larger moment 
and it has a larger meaning. If you agree, Tom, and I know Frank does, but Tom first, Frank final words, Tom Elvis. You're muted. It's hard to do this in a minute and a half, but very briefly, I would say that uh, Ukraine represents uh, a continuation of uh, the end of history and that uh, the aspirations of the Ukrainians to build a rule of law based democracy is something that um, uh, we need to support. And I have treated uh, basically what what the illiberal movement centered in Russia and Vladimir Putin as kind of a, a counter enlightenment redux, a return to uh, not only power, might makes right, might makes right but uh, a turn away from, uh, from science, rationality, um, uh, from rule of law, from the uh, from the primacy of the individual and democracy, and all of the liberal values of uh, freedom of speech, and so, uh, and I actually personally, I mean, other people may have other ideas, but I certainly see the attack on Ukraine as very much an attempt to squelch that among a among a. Uh, a Slavic brother, uh, where uh, the success of liberal democracy, as it has been tried out there, uh, would really give the lie to Putin's assertion that that um, that those who came out of the Soviet Union, especially the Slavs, for some reason, um, uh, are do not accept the or the Slavic Orthodox tradition. Do, uh, for them, liberal democracy is inappropriate. End of sermon. Tom, thank you. Frank? Well, I couldn't put it better than uh, Tom did. I remind everybody that in 2019, Putin gave this interview to the uh, Financial Times in which he asserted that liberalism was an obsolete doctrine. So he certainly has it in his sights. Viktor Orban said he wanted to create an illiberal democracy and has largely succeeded. Uh, in Hungary. And so certainly, you know, internationally, there's this clear perception that liberalism uh, is the uh, target precisely in, you know, my sense that a liberal society is one that is tolerant, that, you know, tolerates various forms of uh, diversity. And I think um, these populist nationalists do not like that. Uh, and so there is a global struggle going on, uh, which has a manifestation in our country, but, you know, uh, I think requires international solidarity in order to sustain as a, as a global system. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all for coming today, participating. I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody. There were questions and comments in chat next time, but I hope everybody read them. Frank, congratulations. The book is called Liberalism and its Discontents. It's a fabulous read. It's extremely important. Thank you, Frank. Thank Thanks you, for Jeff. Being with us today, Thanks. Everybody. Thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you. Bye.